Well, continuing in our series on a biblical approach to apologetics, uh, which is simply, as we looked at last week, is uh, just a biblical approach to giving a reasoned defense of the faith, which is something that we saw as well last week that we've all been commanded to do uh, in light of 1 Peter 3.15. Um, and I, I enjoyed what our brother said in the prayer as well. This is something as well out of love for neighbor uh, that we should want to endeavor in to learn other false worldviews because uh, most likely some of our neighbors are holding some of these. Um, and so this is a great way to be equipped to, to how to have those conversations and, and correct the truth. Uh, but continuing that, this evening we're going to devote our time to looking at the prosperity gospel, as it is called. We'll uh, devote our time uh, this evening and, and next Wednesday uh, to this. And how we'll examine this is how we'll examine uh, every other false worldview that we're going to be looking at in the next coming weeks. Uh, we'll get some of the history of how it began and started. We'll then look at some of the core or main tenets uh, that they teach. Uh, and then we'll engage the teaching itself from Scripture as we do as we've been commanded to do, uh, honoring the Lord as holy, giving that reason to defense. So just to begin with some of the history of how the prosperity gospel began and, and how it started, uh, what we really have in our day, or in our present day form of the prosperity gospel is, is a mixture of what is called the New Thought Movement and, and what we know as Pentecostalism. Um, the New Thought Movement, which, which emerged in the 1880s, was responsible for popularizing the idea that we have the power in our minds to achieve prosperity. Uh, this is when the law of attraction and positive thinking uh, start to be popularized. Uh, law of attraction, popular or uh, positive thinking. It's this, you know, this understanding that if, if I think good thoughts, and I'm going to attract good things to my life. If I think bad thoughts, and I'm going to attract bad things to my life. No wonder you're, you know, sick all the time, or bad things are happening. You're, you're not thinking rightly, or something along those lines. Uh, well, a, a man by the name of Essek Kenyon. Uh, you'll see him sometime noted as E. W. Kenyon. Uh, a once Baptist minister is, is credited with introducing these New Thought teachings into early Pentecostalism. Uh, in the 1890s, Kenyon attended Emerson College of Oratory where he was exposed to the New Thought movement. He later became connected with well-known Pentecostal leaders. And in that, the blend of evangelical religion and mind power beliefs, what uh, Kenyon termed as overcoming faith, it, it resonated with a small, at this time, a small but influential segment of the Pentecostal movement as Pentecostals had always been devoted to faith healing, just not directly this understanding of, of the way you think and the way you talk and things like that and, and attracting things to you. But they had always been devoted to faith healing and uh, it, it, it would in time, this teaching along would, would grow along with that. Uh, by the 1940s and 1950s, this teaching had really taken shape within Pentecostal thought. The key runners then in, in getting this thing to where it is today is uh, two men by the name of, uh, one is Kenneth Hagin, the other one is Oral Roberts. You may have heard of these men before. They would go around the country speaking in different revivals. Kenneth Hagin is known as one of the prominent pioneers, the, the pioneer within prosperity theology of what we know as word faith. Um, the belief that our words have the power to create things around us. Kenneth Hagin is the one that really pioneered all of that. Uh, and, and Oral Roberts is prominent in the teaching of what is called seed faith, uh, the idea of what you sow, you, you, you reap. Uh, upon sowing financial seed, you reap a financial or a prosperous harvest. Uh, Oral Roberts began preaching on the radio in 1947 and then on TV in 1954, this is really when large tele, uh, televangelism ministries started popping up. Uh, and Oral Roberts actually had the most watched religious show in America at that time. You can see why a lot of exposure to this kind of thinking uh, pervades American thought, or a lot of uh, American Christian thought. Uh, Hagen, Kenneth Hagen would begin on radio a little later and on TV as well. And, and the movement would continue to grow in, into what we see today. And what we see today with, you know, such your, your Kenneth Copeland's, your Benny Hens, T.D. Jakes, uh, Joyce Meyer, uh, Paula White, Todd White. You can just keep filling in the blank. 
Uh, it's very popular today, and there are different reasons for that, but a lot of it is, is just as I mentioned about uh, Robert's big tele televangelism ministry, a lot of that is from the fact that just about all of Christian television promotes this false teaching. When you go to any profession, uh, professing Christian uh, TV show or TV station, this is the majority of what you're going to see taught on professing Christian TV. And today as well, a lot of the popular Christian artists and worship bands are, are either proponents of prosperity theology or they're actual worship bands to churches that teach prosperity theology. So you can see how this can, can pervade the thought. And we've already mentioned briefly some of what they believe. I'm sure many of these we know, if not all of them, since it is kind of widespread uh, in our uh, well, in our area and in this country. Let's mark some of the high points down. So that's just getting a brief history of it. Um, some of the high points, I have four of them. Uh, number one is that Jesus purchased all the benefits of salvation for this life. That's the first, you could say, main tenet. Um, Jesus purchased all the benefits of salvation for this life. I mean, in this age, for the here and now, right here where we stand, uh, not in the age to come right now. Uh, Jesus purchased complete physical healing for his people in this life through his death on the cross. That's not me saying that I agree with that. I'm just saying what they believe. And through different verses, they try to assert the idea that Jesus died to take away every sickness in this life and to take his people out of financial pro uh, poverty. So in including sin is, is the sin, you could say, of being in financial poverty and being sick. Uh, Isaiah 53, 5 states that with his wounds we're healed. Thus, healing is ours. It says with his wounds we're healed, so healing should be ours. And while Isaiah 53, 4 states that surely he has borne our griefs and our sorrows, those words in the Hebrew can mean that he has borne our sicknesses and, and our pain. Those words can mean that. Those words in Isaiah 53, 4 are also used elsewhere in Scripture to mean sickness and to mean pain. So they, they, they can mean that. And in light of Jesus' healing ministry, that is definitely something they would point to as Matthew himself states in Matthew eight seventeen that Jesus' healing ministry was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. And your New Testament will, will say, as, as Matthew records, he took our illnesses and bore our diseases. That's what it says in Matthew as he quotes Isaiah 53, 4. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Um, also, John 10.10 10 states that the Lord Jesus, the good shepherd, who lays his life down for the sheep, uh, came that we would have life and have it abundantly. So an abundant life is a life without sickness, a life of prosperity. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8.9 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 states that the Lord Jesus, though he was rich, yet for our sake became poor so that we by his poverty would become rich. So he was rich, he became poor, so that we would become rich. So, I, I mean, I should be rich. This is purchased for me right now through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. So within the framework of what's being said here, they're going to point to verses like these and say, yes, Jesus died so that I could uh, have complete healing today in the here and now, and that I could be purchased out of financial poverty into financial prosperity. So by believing in Jesus, these things are to come into your life and be experienced. Going along with that, it's really the same kind of thought. Uh, secondly, would not only be that all of what Jesus has accomplished in salvation should be attributed to us now, but secondly would be a present day inheritance. Uh, a present day inheritance. In the Abrahamic covenant and the subsequent covenant stemming from that given through Moses, God's covenant community of people are promised physical prosperity. They're promised blessing uh, to be a great nation, blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed when, blessed when you go out, blessed when you come in. Uh, your barns are going to be blessed. You're, just, you're, just, you're going to be blessed if, if you're in this covenant. Um, they are as well promised land. And so you, you can see the thinking that they connect in their minds. So, Galatians 3.29, since by faith in Christ we are uh, offspring of Abraham, heirs according to the promise, 
Well, if this was promised to Abraham and his seed, and I'm an heir of offspring, or and I'm an heir uh, in, uh, in Christ of Abraham, I'm an offspring of Abraham, then why wouldn't these blessings be coming to me as well? Right? These were promised in the covenant, and so they should be coming to me. But, along with the belief that, that Jesus obtained uh, this through his death, and that this is ours as we are Abraham's offspring and heirs to the inheritance, is the very man-centered thinking as well, that while this is true, while we do have this inheritance, and while Jesus has purchased these things for us through his death on the cross, uh, the obtaining of these things purely rests upon us. We have, we have to obtain. Though, though they have been obtained for us, we have to reach out by our faith and, and grab a hold of them. We have to, to work, in a sense, to get them. It's, it, it is workspace to get these things. So thirdly, uh, a core tenet would be we must give to get. We must give to get. Um, the way to gain these riches is to give more money to the kingdom. That's how you get it. That's how you obtain it. The way, the way to get is to give. Uh, the Bible states in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, that whoever sows sparingly, right? If you don't sow a lot, if you don't give a lot, you'll also reap sparingly. And, and then it says as well, whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So that is in, in Scripture. That if you, if you give unto the Lord and his people sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. If you give bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. Oral Roberts is quoted as saying, Remember, only what you give can God multiply back. If you give nothing, and even if God were to multiply it, it would still be nothing. So, if you don't give anything, he'll multiply that, but you know, something times zero, kids, you should know this, is zero. So if you don't give anything, God's not going to put anything back in, in your lap. So giving is going to be a big deal, not out of heartfelt worship to God, not out of love for the brethren and expanding and seeing that the kingdom of God progresses. The giving is going to be a big deal in order to get, in order to obtain more, in order to store, in, in order that my barns would be blessed, to use that covenant terminology from before. So you have to give in order to get. Along with that is name it and claim it, or word faith. We must, as we have the ability to do so, speak these things into existence. We must speak health and wealth over our lives. Now, this is where you hear in different church contexts the idea of someone decreeing or declaring something to be. Uh, this is where that idea comes from, because it doesn't come from Scripture. Um, this is where that comes from. We must speak these things over our lives. That which we speak will be. It's, it's simply, you remember what I mentioned before in the history of it, with the New Thought Movement emerging in the 1880s? It's simply the New Thought Movement with some Christian lingo sprinkled on top. That's, that's all that it is. Uh, Proverbs 18, verse 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Our tongue, if you're taking that the way that they take it, has literally the power of life and death in it. I've heard Jesse Duplantis, which is a, a, another prosperity gospel teacher from, from New Orleans, I've, I've heard him say from this verse before that we actually get to choose when we, when we die. We, we choose you know, how long we live, we choose when we die, because we have the power of life and death in our tongue. Death and life are in our, are, are in our tongue's power, which... Duplantis and other prosperity teachers take to mean that we actually form or create life or death. We form or create wellness or sickness by what we say. And understanding this or underlying this thinking is also the little God's doctrine that is prominent in a lot of uh, health and wealth prosperity uh, gospel teachers theology, the teaching that that states that as we are made in the image of God, we are actually little gods. And so you can, I mean, you can look this up on YouTube. I've heard uh, Creflo Dollar say it before. I've heard Joyce Meyer say it before. You know, when, when cats get together, what do cats make? Cats. When cows get together, what do cows make? Cows. What a, just name the animal. When they get together, what do they make? So what does, what, when the Godhead comes together to make something, what do they make? They make a god. That's their, 
their thinking there. So we are actually, we are gods in, in this understanding. We are literal carbon copies of God. They believe that Adam was a carbon copy of Yahweh, exactly like Yahweh, um, which would mean as he fall that God has the ability to sin. Um, but we're gods in their thinking who have the power to create just as God does. And by faith in Christ, we get our Godship back. And this power of the words is, that, that's why it's so prominent there. I can say things and actually create things in my life. Because I, by faith in Christ, I have my Godship back. And, and I can speak whatever I want to, and it should be. Um, this, this is also the understanding that they would place over certain promises from Jesus about asking things in prayer. Uh, and if you believe, you'll receive them, right? They, this is eisegesis. They take their, instead of reading the, the passage in context and seeing what Jesus is saying there, they bring their understanding into it and say, see, I can say whatever I want and believe it, and it, and it will be. I can move a mountain. I can, I can do whatever I want to do because I have that kind of power by faith in Christ. Um, along with that is, is uh, those certain promises of prayer that we heard throughout the upper room as well in John 13 to 17. That, you know, whatever you ask in my name, I will do, and so forth. They don't read it in the context. They just take it to say, I can, I can do whatever I want to do. Um, and and, I, and it, it must happen. So just from marking out these four things, you can notice that while Christ is a part of the message, the central theme is having your best life now. The, the central theme is having things come to pass in your life that you want. It's, the central theme in this is really you. It's not Christ. Um, and in that, you can see why this message would be accepted by so many, because rather than wanting Christ, what does a natural man want? They want the darkness. They want what they want. They, we're all naturally selfish. So you give me a God who's going to give me the power to create what I want and give me my best life now, well, I'll take that. Sure, yeah, I'll take that. So, so while greed and coveting is sin, as revealed by God, this false worldview gives one uh, the ability to justify their greed and coveting. Right? I can covet, I can be greedy over a certain things. There's not a problem with that because I'm going to keep believing for that thing and speaking that over my life and giving until I get it. So whether they're already earthly rich and successful or they're beggars on the street, you, you get the right to be greedy and, and covet as, as a little God here on God's earth getting what you want. And I'm going to go back and hit each of these marks and do what we talked about last week from uh, Proverbs 26 in answering the fool according to his folly. Uh, you remember Proverbs 26 verse 4 to 5 says, Answer not a fool according to his folly. Lest, lest you be like him yourself, and then to answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. But let's begin here before we go through and just go through those main tenets of teaching or begin to do so. Uh, this thinking does not glorify God in Christ at all. If you go back and you think about it, it doesn't glorify God at all. Uh, these people are, are, people who are holding to this aren't, aren't in the faith. They're, they're not seeking to glorify God. God in Christ. They're believing in another God. Uh, it doesn't worship and glory in him. It worships and glories in physical prosperity. That's all it does. It turns God from being the one in whom is found all the fullness of joy, uh, Proverbs 16, 11, into the one who just reveals and helps you get through different means to what the actual fullness of joy is, which is prosperity, which is health and wealth. It doesn't see Christ as the bread of life, who he reveals himself to be. It sees Christ as the stepping stone, who you must step upon. We can be exclusive, or they can be exclusive in that sense. You must step upon this stone. You must revere him to be able to achieve the true bread of life, which is physical prosperity, health and wealth, getting what you want, your selfish desires. In this thinking, Jesus is just another example to us on how to achieve our best life now as any other figure in Scripture is. Uh, he shows us how to exercise faith to get what we want. Christ is diminished, man is elevated. Christ is just another example to show us how we get what we want by faith, how to exercise our faith to move our own mountains and, and so forth. As 
in this type of thinking overall, Scripture just gets turned into a health and wealth handbook. Thus, all the Old Testament stories as well get turned into right how we defeat our giants, how our Jericho walls can come tumbling down, and, and things of that nature. Right? It, it, it turns Scripture where Jesus would tell us that all Scripture is pointing to him and is foreshadowing him. It turns Scripture into how can I, how can I you know, activate my faith to get my best life now? So, so that what's standing in opposition to me will be driven down. It is, it's, it's ridiculous, it's horrible, and it's, it's blasphemy. It's a, it's a perversion of who God is. It's a perversion of his character and what he has revealed in his word. And as I, as I mentioned last week, with this, with they already accepting that, that the Bible is scripture, there, there are steps in, a, in, in the apologetic method that I don't have to go through because I don't have to show them why they must submit to scripture to know truth. They already, in a sense, believe that. They just have this all perverted. So we need to go in and, and, and correct the, the foolishness of their thinking in accordance with scripture. So we can go back now and address these four marks and how they hold up. And what we'll do is address the first one this evening for the sake of time, and we'll come back next Wednesday and we'll address the later three. Um, but number one, Jesus purchased all the benefits of salvation for this life, for the here and now. Uh, I would say in beginning that there's obviously a misunderstanding of what salvation is because it is not sickness and poverty that separate us from God. Sickness and poverty don't separate us from God. It's our sin. We don't need to be saved from sickness and poverty. Uh, we need to be saved from sin. That's what we need to be saved from. That's the consistent message of Scripture. That's the consistent preaching of Jesus and the apostles. That's reflected over and over again. Um, you, you never find the apostles preaching this understanding of people's need to come to Jesus so that they can have their sickness and poverty done away with. You just don't find There's just not one instance of it. It's just not there. Uh, Acts 3.19, repent. And turn back that your sins may be blotted out. The times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Why do times of refreshing come? Because our sins are blotted out. We're safe from sin. We're reconciled to God. Acts 5.31 proclaims that God exalted Christ at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. Acts 13 verse 38. Let it be known to you therefore, brothers... That through this man, in the context speaking about Christ, through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. That's, that's the message. That's, that's the teaching of the New Testament. That's the teaching of, of, the, uh, of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ who were sent out by him. Those whom the Lord Jesus promised that the Spirit of God would come and bring to their remembrance all that he said to them. That was their preaching. Forgiveness of sins. Come to Christ. Repent. That your sins may be forgiven. That's what we find over and over again. Uh, the focus is never on physical, financial, or material prosperity in this life. Though we can step back and say there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying the focus is not that in salvation. 1 Timothy 6.5, the Apostle Paul actually says that those who suppose that godliness is a means to gain, those who think this way, that godliness is a means or an avenue to gain, and in the context you can clearly see he's talking about financial gain. Those who suppose this are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Well, that's, I, I would love to hear someone who would hold a prosperity teaching preach that verse. And what, what does that mean? Because I don't see how you can work a way around that. Those who suppose that godliness is a means of gain, 1 Timothy 6, 5, are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Because the abundant life, and they are, because the abundant life that the Good Shepherd gave himself for us to experience is eternal life, which is to know God. Which is to know God and His only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's being in communion and fellowship with our God, communion and fellowship that our sin destroyed, not communion and fellowship that me getting sick and me being poor destroyed, if I am poor. Beloved, it was for our sake, 2 Corinthians 5.21, that the Father made Christ to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. Now, sin has always been the problem from the beginning. Rebellion against God. Sin has been the problem. So, Paul obviously didn't mean in 2 Corinthians 8 that Christ became poor 
so that we would become financially rich. He does use the terminology. Christ became poor for our sake so that by his poverty we would become rich. Uh, but Paul couldn't mean that. If he did, he would be contradicting himself. He's taught elsewhere that those who think that godliness is a means to financial gain to, to prosperity are, de, are de, depraved of the truth, deprived of the truth. They're depraved of mind and deprived of the truth. He obviously doesn't mean that. But that doesn't mean that Christ didn't become poor for our sake, because he did. That's what, that's what Paul says. He did become poor for our sake. Uh, as Paul expounds on elsewhere in, in Philippians 2, verse 5 to 11, as Christ emptied himself, he left the glories of heaven. I would say he became poor for our sake there. He left the glories of heaven for us, for our stead. Uh, the, the, the light entered into the darkness to be spit upon, hated, people coming at him from every corner. Yeah, he, he, he became poor for sure. Uh, he went to the cross to be treated as nothing so that we would become rich. Rich in faith, rich in salvation and having sins forgiven and reconciled to God. Rich in having every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in him, Ephesians 1.3. Yeah, I'm rich. I have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. I'm, I'm pretty rich. I have a lot in my possession. Rich in having him who is the fullness of joy, but not rich with pockets of cash. That's not, that's not what it's talking about. Now, Paul does say that Jesus became poor so that we would become rich there in 2 Corinthians 8 as a model for how we are to give financially to the church. I would say some of what, that's why he's using that terminology there. Because he is using it in the context of how we ought to be giving financially to the church. But he's just using that as an example or a model of how Christ gave unto himself to us that we should give ourselves to the brothers as well. It's about the same thing that John says in 1 John 3, 16, where he says, in this we know love. Christ gave himself for the brothers and we ought to as well. When Christ became poor for us to give unto us. We, do, we ought to do the same. Emptying ourselves, just as Paul says in Philippians 2, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And I think, I think we can just look at the lives of the apostles to see that if that were true, and, and we don't see that in Scripture. Uh, we don't see that in Acts. Uh, if this understanding of wealth and health were true, why weren't the apostles always healthy and, and so forth? You don't see that. Paul mentions in Galatians of him being sick, something going on with his eyes. Um, you could even see something of that in, in 2 Corinthians when he talks about the thorn in the flesh. Uh, everything just, you know, just wasn't all good all the time for them. And they weren't riding around in chariots on, on 24th. Uh, so they weren't just you know, riding around with gold and, and being flashy. They, they, weren't, they, they just weren't doing it. Uh, because Jesus didn't die for that. Jesus didn't die for that. Jesus died the death we deserve because of sin. He lived the righteous life he did for our legal justification before God in light of our sin and our need uh, to be justified by his righteousness in the Father's sight. Jesus rose from the grave showing that our sins would forever be gone and that his righteousness would forever intercede for us in our salvation as we are conformed into his image and saved from sin, thus experientially in our sanctification, and then at his return, saved from the very uh, presence of sin in our glorification in the new heavens and new earth. So within that biblical understanding, seeing, seeing that salvation is saving us from sin, reconciling us to God, to then say that all the benefits of salvation are purchased for the here and now is just a complete misunderstanding of, of the already but not yet uh, aspect of salvation. Uh, because you can say that, that sickness and subsequent death are certainly results from sin and the fall that will be overturned by the death of Christ in our stead. Uh, sickness, subsequent death, our consequences of sin our consequences of the fall that will be overturned by Christ uh, in his death in our stead. Death comes from sin. Thus, if I'm to be saved from sin, then I must be saved from death and sickness that goes along with that as well. But that hasn't been promised for the now. That's where, that's where they're getting off in that aspect. All aspects of what Christ has purchased for us on the cross is not, come, is not coming to us in the here and now. Death is the last enemy to be destroyed by the conqueror King Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. The fullest expression of physical fallness, fallenness will be put to death by Christ when he returns. So, you know, I have, I have no problem with including an understanding of physical healing in the atonement. Just not now. I don't have a problem with saying that physical healing has been purchased because... 
Christ is saving us from sin and the atonement, and death and sickness comes from sin, comes from the fall. So I don't have a problem with saying physical healing has been purchased for, for us by Christ and the atonement. It just hasn't been purchased and promised for us now. Not in this age. I have no problem with Matthew saying that Christ's healing ministry is to fulfill the fact that Christ bore our illnesses and diseases because in bearing our sin, he did bear our illnesses and our diseases. Uh, but the effects of that are not to be experienced until his return when all of his cross work is brought to fruition. Now, there is another way that you could look at that passage uh, in seeing the physical manifestation of Christ's signs as spiritual reality, something of the same that we saw from John as his as his signs, his physical signs were putting on spiritual, putting on display spiritual realities that are only found in him. Um, but I don't have a problem in seeing it as, as speaking of Christ bearing our physical infirmities, our sicknesses, our diseases, uh, because that, that is true. Um, as Jesus has conquered all the former fallen things of this world, and while we will rise in glorified sinless bodies, that will not get sick or die. When he returns, Christ has purchased that, that for us. When he returns... We'll be raised in a glorified body, a body that knows no sin, a body that is not fallen at all, and it will never get sick and it will never die. Praise the Lord. Christ saves the whole man, body and soul. Some of that, uh, that, that begins to be experienced now. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old is passing away and the new has come, and the fullness of that new is not experienced until he returns. So it's not scriptural at all to say that all of Jesus' salvation is for now. And if it was true, here's the folly of the position. If it was true earlier, I just, I just asked then, why don't we see that in scripture from the apostles? But if this was true, then why do prosperity gospel teachers themselves get sick? Why do they get sick? If it's true, why do they age? That's a part of the fall. Why do they age and why do their bodies break down? Why do they get old? Why do they die? Because they do. Why do all these things happen? Because of what, what they teach is false. It's not true. It's, it's, not, it's not true at all. It's foolishness. All the benefits of salvation have been purchased by Christ, but they have not been purchased for this age. We are reconciled to God. We are, we are sanctified. We are, we are more and more in this life conformed to his image. Uh, where, where that which God hates is, is, is cleansed out of us and that which he loves is cultivated more and more in our hearts. Um, and on that blessed day when the Lord Jesus returns, we'll experience the fullness of that and glorify sinless bodies. And the, and, and the fullness of holiness without spot, blemish, or any such thing as Christ presents his bride to himself. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised in accordance with the scriptures. And if you believe upon Christ... Your sins will be forgiven. You will be reconciled to your holy and just God whom you have rebelled and transgressed against, whom all of us have. And we have the future hope then of being resurrected by Christ when he returns to bring to realization, fruition, consummation. When, when, when he brings all of this together, that which he has fulfilled for us on the cross. If you believe in Christ and you get sick and you die, or if you believe in Christ and you're poor, um, that, that doesn't mean that Christ's atonement was not effectual towards you. It doesn't mean that. If you get sick and die, it doesn't mean that, that God's disfavor is upon you. It doesn't mean that Christ's atonement uh, wasn't effectual towards you. Because in Christ Jesus, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Not life, not death, Paul says. But it doesn't mean that. We haven't been promised to always be healthy and wealthy in this temporal fallen age. But when Christ returns, we will be full of health and wealth in his presence for an eternity. On that day, I will experience by, by faith and sight what it means to have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places because of Christ. Supremely found just being in his presence and having the person of Christ himself. Amen. Beloved, that is what we should set our hope on because Christ is not the means or the stepping stone to a greater end. He is the end. He is the bread of life. He's the door. He's the good shepherd. He is the resurrection and the life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to Father but through him. In him is where you find everything that you need. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will have all that you need in him. 
All that you need in this life is found in Christ, in his ways, in his works, in his word. Thus we can say with Paul, it doesn't matter whether I'm financially prosperous, whether I'm physically well or not. I can do all things because of Christ. I can endure. I can go through all things because of Christ because he is my all. He is my treasure. He, he fulfills me. He, he, he satisfies me. I can have all, it doesn't matter about these things because of Christ. Well, that concludes our lesson for this evening. Uh, we will finish responding to the other three points next Wednesday. But uh, before concluding in prayer, any comments or questions?